Hello friends, it's time to venture underground again for another small but interesting creature. And I'm talking about the piercer. Okay guys, if you're following along at home in your fifth edition monster manual, we're on page 252. So the piercer is not a powerful creature. Sometimes I pick out weak creatures and I give ideas about how to scale them up and make them more challenging. And I'm going to do a little bit of this, but really I just wanted to pick something that's fun and a little bit challenging against low-level creatures, or sorry, low-level parties, uh, and this low-level creature does just that. So the piercer is a medium monstrosity, um, and it's definitely not smart. It has a uh, one intelligence and a seven wisdom. So. Uh, it's a thing, really, is what I would call this. Clinging to the ceilings of caverns and large subterranean passages, piercers blend in perfectly with natural rock, dropping in silence to impale unsuspecting foes on the ground below. A piercer is the larval form of a roper, and the two creatures often attack in tandem. A rock-like shell encases a piercer's body, giving it the look and texture of a stalactite. That shell protects a soft, slug-like upper body that lets the piercer move across cavern walls and ceilings to position itself for prey. With its eye and mouth closed, the piercer is difficult to distinguish from ordinary rock formations. Piercers can see, but they can also respond to noise and heat, waiting for living creatures to pass beneath them, then falling to attack. A piercer that misses its chance to kill must make its slow way back to the ceiling a fallen piercer excretes a foul-smelling slime when attacked, making most predators think twice about eating it. Piercers gather in colonies to maximize the effectiveness of their attacks, dropping simultaneously to increase the odds of striking prey. After a pier piercer successfully slays a creature, the others slowly creep toward the corpse to join in the feast. So, kind of imagine for a second that you're running a, an adventure and you have a pit trap right, a standard dungeon encounter that doesn't involve combat per se. It just involves someone noticing the pit and then not falling into it or making a deck save, something like that. Um, imagine now that you reverse that and instead of a pit, it's a whole bunch of stuff on the ceiling. Again, imagine that nobody necessarily has the passive perception to notice or says that they're actively looking for anything and they're walking through this cave formation full of stalactites and they go quite a ways and then these things start dropping on them. That is a great encounter for a low-level group. It's even a decent encounter for a mid-level group, just more as an annoyance than anything else, really, but still something that you can drop, right? Now, if you want to make this more powerful, you could certainly scale it up by adding in the roper to the encounter, as they, they've suggested here. These, these work in tandem, so you can have a bunch of piercers, and then a roper or two ropers or however many ropers you want that you need to add in to scale this up for a mid-level encounter or a higher level encounter. Let's take a look at the stat block. Armor class of 15, which is huge. That's actually huge for a low-level party to encounter. Um, so hitting them is not necessarily the easiest thing on the planet. Then they have 3d8 plus 9 hit points which is a lot for a one-half CR rating creature. They are slow, there's no, no doubting that. They have blind sight 30 feet, dark vision 60 feet, um, and they have false appearance. While the piercer remains motionless on the ceiling, it is indistinguishable from a normal stalactite. They have spider climb. The piercer can climb difficult surfaces, including upside down on ceilings without needing to make an ability check. Pretty handy. Um, their attack action is drop. It's a melee weapon attack, plus three to hit, one creature directly underneath the piercer. It does 1d6 piercing damage for every 10 feet fallen up to 66. So if they fall from six, say you're in a huge cavern, right? And way up on top of the ceiling, 60 feet or more, then they could be doing 66. If they miss, the piercer takes half the normal falling damage for the distance fallen. 
So there's a good chance if you have these things dropping from 60 feet that they're going to be basically almost dead once they hit the ground if they miss. Now, a small drop isn't bad, 1d6. So let's think about how we use these things in encounters and an adventure. So let's take our options for setting. These have the advantage if you put them in a cave or cavern system, obviously, right? If you have these in a dungeon, people are gonna be suspicious. Like, why are there stalactites in the dungeon? I don't know, why are there stalactites in the dungeon? But then again, you could easily take a dungeon crawl integrate a earthquake where there's like a major fissure that breaks through the dungeon, the man-made dungeon, into a cave system. And then you can integrate these things into a dungeon crawl. But I'd like to think of another way to use them. You ever been underneath a bridge and seen like the mineral deposits that sometimes like kind of are oozing through the concrete and some of them even form this like stalactite kind of thing? So what if you have a great old stone bridge that's you know really far up and the party's traveling underneath it along a dry riverbed and these things live underneath that bridge kind of like bats sometimes live underneath bridges right and they drop now that could be an outside encounter where you can integrate a piercer without even thinking twice and maybe the piercers like that spot because there are a lot of travelers who travel along this dry riverbed going from one location to another and they can drop and make attacks and then they get food. So that's another way that you can integrate them. At low level, you could do that. At low level, you can use the piercer as is and it's a, it's a challenge. At medium, like mid-level, you could just have more of these things or you could scale up the number of hit points that they have or you can create a greater piercer. What's a greater piercer, Bill? Well, a greater piercer probably has the same armor class, but it's large instead of medium-sized. Now imagine this large creature can drop on multiple people because it's large. So suppose you have your group traveling through the cave in a tight formation and they're five feet apart. A greater piercer could drop and do more damage because it's heavier, so automatically double the damage for everything. And it can attack two opponents as long as they're next to each other. Or I guess if you had, if you had four people in, like, in a tight formation, one, two, three, four, in five foot squares, that's 10 by 10. So a large piercer could drop and hit four people, right? So you got a 10 by 10 square that it can drop onto. You double the damage and you give it a greater damage die. So instead of doing 1d6 for every 10 feet, it's doing 1d12. Or, no, scratch that, it does 2d6 for every 10 feet. Because 1d12 still gives it a chance that it could roll one. You wanna increase the potential damage. So maybe it's 2d6 for every 10 feet, which would give you 12d6 damage so all of a sudden, a greater piercer is a much more dangerous threat to a party. Maybe you're like, I don't want a TPK. Maybe you have a few piercers drop down on the party, and while these things are raining down on the party and they're distracted, the greater piercer lops over to its most strategic spot and falls on the, the greatest concentration and greatest density of the party. Or you could say that the greater piercer moves faster. So it does the same damage, but it can actually move faster. Maybe it has um, slime tendrils that allow it to grab and pull itself, okay? So you could have it do more damage, you could have it move faster, you could scale those things up. Another option is to put the greater piercer and a bunch of regular piercers in tandem with some ropers and maybe some other cave-dwelling creatures, hmm? like Grimlocks or Chokers. Um, yeah, so you could have a whole bunch of these things, a whole subterranean adventure series. Now, I don't know about stretching these into a campaign. You'd have to come up with something pretty far-fetched, like the piercers 
are actually ruled by a more powerful than the greater piercer kind of piercer or a sentient creature that can you know telepathically communicate and coordinate attacks with other piercers but that seems to get a little bit out of control unless you put wings on the piercers so now they could hang out on cliff tops and mountains and they can actually glide and attack winged piercers see how we just took this modified it and now you've expanded the, the repertoire in which you can use the piercer a winged piercer can appear to be a rock on a cliff or a mountainside or a rocky hill near a beach and they could jump off and glide and make attacks from a distance eh? what do you think about that maybe they could spit acid they could make acid attacks so just some thoughts Piercers are a pretty simple creature. You can integrate them into a lot of different scenarios. You can modify them to throw some curveballs at your party. For those of you who have more experienced players who maybe would scoff at the piercer, throw a greater piercer at them and see what happens then. Or some winged piercers who spit acid. So just some thoughts there. Hope you enjoyed this very short episode of Monster Monday. Make sure that you like, subscribe, and click that notifications bell, and we'll see you for the next one.